Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, so today what I'll do is I'll just quickly um, introduce uh, about the project we're going to do. Um, so I wanted to take a break from the theory we have been doing because I think we can start parallelly before we do two-stage design uh, and compensation of uh, op amps. Uh, uh, so it's basically the same project we had discussed, I think in the beginning of the year, I don't know how many of you were there. I think most of you were there. Um, so it's the same uh, project, but um, I'll be adding uh, sort of another new one to it. Can you all see my video or? Not able to see it. Yes, sir, we can be, see you. Okay, so um, can change one second. Okay, um, so I think I've kind of divided this into um, sort of two main projects, um, and they're all going to be uh, the microphone preamplifier based. I think it's a, a good analog project which will give you exposure to pretty much all design aspects of analog design. Um, at the same time, in, you know, you can go to the depth of it. Basically, you'll know amplifier design, which is kind of uh, the main core of um, analog design. So the first project uh, will be the MEMS microphone preamplifier for mobile phones. And I think I showed this slide while I was there in the beginning of the year. Um, you know, I showed you uh, different parts of the cell phone and I showed you if you look at the right hand side here let me just switch to a uh, if you look in the right hand side over here there's a little um, you know black object jotting out of it that's essentially the, the MEMS microphone along with the preamplifier in it and then the preamplifier is connected to inside the phone and um, that's what amplifies your voice and all that and sends it over the network and that preamplifier specification, I think I'd shown you also beginning of, and we'll see more when we go into it, but I think I'll go slowly. I'll start dividing the problem because there's a lot of noise and distortion uh, specifications, uh, which uh, you may not understand right away. So we'll go step by step. Um, so that's essentially what it is. It's a preamplifier for the mo mobile one. Um, the second one, um, and this is something which I've kind of, been thinking about this, I don't think there is an application right now, but it'll be a, a really good application um, for smart city solutions, uh, but it can be used for many other applications as well. So the idea is uh, basically to create um, sound processing wireless, very low frequency, high range wireless nodes uh, for smart city applications. So essentially what it is, is you're trying to monitor sound pollution. Um, now, if you see this map here, you know, I've kind of shown a, a example, uh, you know, city, just a part of it, you know, you got highways, you got residential locations here, you got parks and office location and so on. And so the idea is to create this small sensor nodes, um, uh, which can wirelessly connect to one gateway or two gateway and eventually connect to one cloud source and uh, monitor everything. Um, so the pink, you know, little pink blocks you see over here, they're kind of representing each one of those sound processing nodes. So, so they have to be really ultra low power because usually when you're spreading um, uh, uh, nodes like this, uh, then um, did the power go off? Yeah, actually the power is gone off, so that's why, I mean, lights are off. But, but can we continue or? Uh... Yeah, you can continue. Okay, so I'll go ahead. Okay, so the, the, um, these are the uh, each of the nodes. And so essentially the difference between the previous one and this is in the cell phone, um, you don't have much of power constraints. Usually you'll give it power constraint, but the performance is the key. In, the, in other words, the need the uh, really uh, high SNR, signal to noise ratio, so wide band, uh, very low distortion, um, the sound sensitivity should be really good. So basically when you're speaking in the phone, you know, it's almost high fidelity uh, voice quality from the cell phone. 
But for this application, um, again, I haven't made up the specs yet, but I'll, you know, we can slowly make, but the key for this would be really, really low power. And the whole idea is to actually detect a certain threshold of noise. I mean, we don't have to detect a very low noise. So maybe, um, you know, 94 dB SPL is sort of the standard voice, you know, what I'm speaking right now is in the order of 94 dB SPL. So maybe 10 to 20 dB higher than that and go all the way to what's called a threshold limit of 125 dB SPL, which is almost like airplanes, you know, when you're in airport. Um, so we want to record that kind of sound and we don't need a whole lot of fidelity. We just want to see if the sound is uh, crossing a certain threshold um, or not. And we'll and the obviously we are not going to be dealing with the wireless node and you know everything related to the wireless part of it. We'll just do a sensor node, but the hope is eventually we will also build the wireless node. And I'll show you what goes inside the the wireless node after that. Uh, so that's the key idea. Like as I said, the previous one is going to be a high performance design, and this is going to be a low performance but very low power. So each one will have challenges on their own. Um, in the previous one, the cell phone one, you'll, you'll have challenges to uh, meet performance, uh, basically meet really good linearity, meet really good noise and so on. Uh, in this one, uh, your challenges will be trying to do it at a lower power. How low? Again, as I said, we don't have a, you know, there's no industry product right now, so we're going to make it up as we go, but the idea would be to make it as low as we can go. Um, and see how far we can push it. So the, essentially that will push us to create innova enough innovation so that we can actually use this project um, you know, for publishing or you know, design contest and so on, so on, so that you can actually get recognition for it. Um, so the idea behind these projects is really twofold. One is obviously loan analog uh, at the same time. Um, there should be enough innovation in this that you can actually um, get credits for it as as papers or design contests like cadence design contest is one of the popular ones in India So we can use that. So that's the key and I think um, The project it's it's defined right now. Obviously, there's you know, if we if you are successful, there's going to be enough innovation for us to um, um, You know have visibility or credibility outside All right, so that's the core idea of it. So this is just showing um, what each of these pink blocks are, I mean, what, what I have in mind. Um, so, and, and this is something typically how, how a <clears throat> uh, IoT sensor node, the Internet of Things in sensor node looks like. Uh, for example, in a smart city solution, uh, you might have a temperature um, and humidity sensor. You might have an air quality sensor, which uh, will sense Carbon, mono carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and so on. And along with that, we're gonna attach this sound sensor. So we'll have a microphone with a preamplifier, and we'll have some threshold detectors and um, some very crude uh, way of uh, waking up the system maybe when a certain sound threshold comes in and so on. And those are things we'll, you know, we'll decide as we go on. Um, and that's connected to uh, a SPI bus, that's your communication bus. And uh, usually in, in one of these uh, nodes, IoT nodes, typically you have, uh, and this is a long range um, a node I'm uh, targeting for. What it means by long range is usually anywhere between you know, a few hundred meters to as long as five kilometers or even 10 kilometers. Um, so, so you have, other types of IoT nodes which are meant for office. For example, inside an office, you're, if you're doing this, then they're low range. They're just talking to a Zigbee or a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth. So those are a few meters. But this one, since we're trying to do for smart city applications, we want it to be really long range. Um, so here I've just shown an example, uh, you know, LoRa, which is from, it's a wireless chip, long range IoT wireless chip from a company called Semtech. And they've been become They've become really popular over the years uh, for this long range application. There are other vendors who are competing, but this is some one of the ones I actually like. And then you have a microcontroller unit, which essentially uh, tries, it's, it's essentially a referee between all the sensors and you know when to send a packet, when not to send a packet. And that's what you program inside this um, MCU. 
Um, so like I just said, for, for, for as far as the analog portion is concerned, what we are going to be designing is this yellow block here, and that's all we'll be concentrating. And my hope is, you know, eventually we are successful and we can actually integrate and demonstrate a complete IoT sensor node now with a, you know, gateway and so on. But that that's in the future. Okay, so that's really the motivation behind these two um, um, projects I have in mind. Um, okay, again, I think I gave a presentation in the beginning of the year where I uh, showed you what a MEMS microphone looks like. Uh, and this is a typical microphone right now. And this is from Acoustica and we have one from Knowles, this one on the left-hand side, Knowles. Um, you probably can see uh, like this die, this is a MEMS part. Uh, we won't be dealing with it. I'm hoping to get one of these where we can bond it out. Um, but you can, if you, uh, if you can see, it's a 1.6 millimeter by 1.6 millimeter entire die. So it's really tiny. I mean, it, it's literally, you know, can sit on the, uh, like if you have really thick hair on one strand of hair. Uh, so that's how small these devices are. Uh, uh, that's just showing the layout, like the top picture of uh, the MEMS microphone. Uh, and what it is, is if you see this disc inside, it's a, it's a movable disc. So it's a disc to disc. And as you speak, uh, you, the sound pressure actually uh, changes the distance between the capacitor. So you can imagine a capacitor, but instead of the distance between the capacitor being fixed, uh, you actually, it moves with respect um, uh, with the sound. And that's what converts into electrical signal and you process that and so on. Um, and on the right hand side shows the entire packaging because this needs to go into a package where the backside is, is, uh, is airtight because if it is not airtight, then your sound is gonna just pass through from the opening all the way down. Then you won't get any uh, pressure going onto the capacitor disc. And I'll show you a cross section diagram. Um, um, in the next slide, in the later slide. Um, and these are two typical packages. And this is, if you see the bottom over here, that's what goes on top of this. There's a cover which goes on top of it so that it's airtight. So when this backside becomes airtight, the only opening you have is in this called front cavity. And that's where the sound pressure goes in to move this capacitor plate to create the electric signal which is proportional to your voice, okay? And this is another type of, um, so th these are the most popular ones. These are called the capacitive based, MEMS capacitive based um, microphone. Like as I said, they're, uh, essentially it's the two plates of the capacitor which are moving and changing your capacitance. And by detecting the change of the capacitance, you detect the voice. Um, now recently, there's a company here actually in Boston, a startup, uh, and I'm actually hoping to get some dyes from them that we can actually use these um, uh, microphones here. They're piezo piezoelectric based, so there's not capacitor, it's actually one. Uh, so if you see over here, this is a blown up picture of the same kind of a microphone. Um, this is again a MEMS. By the way, MEMS is a mechanical electromechanical de electro mechanical device, uh, um, a micro electromechanical device. So essentially it's really tiny mechanical devices uh, in electronic uh, um, semiconductor substrates. Uh, so this is one of them. But here, instead of a capacitor, um, actually your diaphragm, which uh, is responsible uh, for the movement uh, corresponding to your voice pressure, is actually a piezoelectric device. So the difference between the piezoelectric device and the capacitance is you don't need two plates. You just have one uh, plate. And as the plate moves up and up and down, um, the voltage across will change because it's a piezoelectric piece. So the, the characteristics of a piezo piezoelectric device is that you get a voltage in proportional to strain. Um, and so if, you, if a certain pressure is straining your piezoelectric material, then you're gonna get a voltage um, corresponding to that. Um, And this is just showing the cross section, how it looks like. So if you take that same piezoelectric MEMS, so you have this MEMS microphone here, and that's in one semiconductor die. And then there's the ASIC die, and this is what we're gonna build. Um, so that's the electronic circuit for it. 
and I'll show you the model um, in the later slides. And if I take the cross section of this, and the cavity is removed, but just imagine there is a cavity, and this whole thing is encapsulated within that. If you take a cross section of that, this is how it'll look like. So you can see there is a cavity which seals it because this needs to be airtight. Otherwise, this diaphragm, this piezoelectric or the capacitive diaphragm will not move with respect to sound because if you have a sound, because there's a hole here, it'll just pass through. Um, so you might get a little bit of a, um, a strain or a deviation, but your, no, uh, your signal sensitivity will be very, very low. So that's why you encapsulate this. So as you can see, this MEMS device over here and the backside of this is this cavity here. So what you're, what you're seeing here, this is actually the top side. So essentially you're seeing um, One second, I can just draw the. Hmm. Anyway, so let me just. All right, I think you get the idea. I can get the annotated to work. One second. All right, so. What I meant was what you're seeing over here, this part is essentially the top view over here. And the back side of this is this back cavity here. Okay, that's all I want to do. All right, this is just for, you know, to give you an overview of understanding. I mean, this really doesn't help you with uh, the circuit, but just to get a good idea um, on how the whole system looks like. So if you convert the entire electromechanical system, the MEMS part of it into a electrical equivalent, this is the entire electrical equivalent, how it looks like. Um, so you can represent all the mechanical part with its equivalent um, uh, RLC structure, right? Like for example, if you have a mass and spring, you can represent that mass and spring with the RLC and um, the displacement can be shown as voltage and so on, right? So you, you can do the similar thing with a mechanical material, a mechanical model and represent it with this. Now, this is really complicated to show you everything which goes in. So you put in acoustic power in and you can actually find out how much electrical output you get out of this model uh, uh, after knowing all the physical parameters, like what the value of this capacitor is for the front cavity, what is the value of this capacitor or the back cavity, and this RLC structure for the microphone and this RL structure for the acoustic radiation damping and so on. But uh, fortunately, most of the modeling guys, they, they have done this and they have actually simplified this into a much simpler model, which is this. And I, again, I think I had spoken a little bit in the beginning of the year when I introduced uh, the MEMS microphone. So essentially, you take that entire mechanical model and you uh, model with this. And this is for a specific microphone. So obviously this will be different for different microphones, but they will be in the similar range. So if we design with enough uh, flexibility or enough margin on it, then we can pretty much design for uh, almost all the MEMS microphones. So the, the, what it looks like is a, a voltage source uh, in series with this uh, capacitor called the C-mic, and that's the main capacitor uh, which the piezoelectric material looks like, or in the case of capacitive microphone, that's your capacitor itself. So if you have a capacitive-based microphone, then that's your main capacitor, actually. And this one here is, as it shows, it's a parasitic capacitance because um, when you are laying out all this in a certain semiconductor, um, you cannot isolate it. It's not in vacuum, right? It's not sitting in vacuum, separated in tens of meters or something like that. They're very close by. So when you have that and you start routing, you're actually going to get um, what's called parasitic capacitance between the, the driving node and the, uh, the other end of the two-port network. So that, that's sort of what the model looks like. And here I've given an example, like typically in that piezoelectric uh, microphone, which I showed you, this C mic will be about one picofarad. This C capacity could be as high as 
five picofarad. Now, typically you want this to be zero, but this is what you get. And this V mic for that particular example I've shown um, is actually 10 millivolt RMS at uh, one Pascal of pre pressure, which is referred to as 94 dB SPL, standard pressure level. In other words, the standard pressure level is minus 94 dB lower than one Pascal or minus one, 94 dB PA. Now, now you, these are the terms used in MEM, so you may not be familiar with this, but so that's why I'm trying to introduce it right now so that you slowly start getting introduced to it. Uh, they're very easy to understand. Um, if you don't, I'll, I'll post some material um, which explains uh, how each of the uh, data sheet specification um, and what is the DBSPL, what's the Pascal pressure and all that. I have some good application note from uh, companies like analog devices and all that, you can go through it. Um, but essentially what it is, is it's one Pascal of pressure gives you 10 millivolt RMS as this voltage source. Um, as far as you are concerned as for designing, you just assume this model. You, you just assume that, oh, you get a voltage source where typically you get about 10 millivolt RMS and I'll show you that this can vary from 10 millivolt RMS all the way to you know, 300, 400 millivolt RMS as the sound pressure goes higher and higher. Um, and this capacitor is about one picofarad and this is about point picofarad, okay? Um, so this is a simple um, ASIC model, how we are going to interface with the microphone. And um, with this lecture, I'm going to give you a problem statement for this week. And please go ahead and do this problem because it's actually key to understanding why we are choosing a certain architecture because the architecture I'm going to be choosing actually is very different than what people use right now. And it'll, it'll make sense if you solve this problem. And I'll tell you the problem statement in the next slide. But uh, so this is how typically people design the preamplifier. So you have this uh, microphone here. Um, you can attach a preamplifier directly to it. Uh, but the problem is because this is a capacitive network here, this node voltage right here is undefined, right? Um, because if I didn't have this resistor bias network over here, this, this node voltage will be undefined because I could have this voltage is one kilovolt or thousand volts or zero volts or whatever it is, this capacitive network should still work. But the problem is if I have 1000 volt or something like that, these capacitors usually will break down because their breakdown voltages are not that high. Um, on top of that, this ASIC which we have, like for example, the technology we are trying to design this in, it's actually a 3.3 volt technology. And typically we want this to be somewhere in the middle. So let's say 1.5 volts. So if you, let's say go to five volt or something, you may not break it down, but it will be not operational anymore. You cannot operate it. Or if it goes to like, for example, 10 volts, then you'll, you'll break down this and basically blow the chip. So for that reason, we actually have to define this node. And, and so typically how you would bias it is you put a high value resistance and put some bias voltage. How do you generate this bias voltage? You know, we've been talking about current mirror and band gaps and that's how we'll generate inside. Or we can just have external bias either coming outside the chip for this, this chip. But in a typical chip, this will also internally be generated. So the thing is that uh, you can do this, but there's a, a small problem and I want you to find this problem. And you can find that problem by solving this problem statement. So what I want you to do is uh, the first part of the problem, um, and you don't have to write it down now. Um, you know, I'll post these slides and you can just uh, take it from then. So first part of the problem is, so I've given you the value for uh, C mic and C parasitic, right? So assume that this amplifier has infinite impedance. In other words, the, uh, it's a capacitive input device. Like for example, it's a MOS input. So if it is a MOS input, then the input looks like a capacitor. Uh, it doesn't look like, like for example, in a BJT, you'll have a certain uh, impedance of your base, which, will, which is, you know, you refer it as RB. Uh, like resistance, but in this case, we'll use MOS transistor, so it looks like a capacitor. But assume that this capacitor is, is very small. Um, so now if I have to bias this, so let's say I have to bias this with 0.8 volts, doesn't matter what value it is. 
So this is a DC bias, V bias, and you have to choose this resistance value to bias this node, but choose this value such that um, V in over V mic is 0.5 for a 20 hertz input, okay? So if I give you a 20 hertz sine wave here, like for example, somebody is speaking or there is a tone at 20 hertz. Um, so this will look like a 20 hertz sine wave signal, right? Now, because it's 20 hertz, there will be a certain impedance by this capacitor, right? Which is one over C omega. Um, this will have a certain impedance of that capacitor. And this is obviously a resistor that impedance is always our bias for all frequencies. So if you write the equation for V in, which is this intermediate node to V mic here, okay, you'll get expression involving all these three, right? Now what you want to do that do is that equate that expression to 0.5. So essentially what I want is I don't want this to drop below 0.5 of this V mic. So the least I want here is, because if you keep decreasing this resistor, it will be so small that all your voltage will drop across here and you'll get very small signal. Then you need a lot of gain and your noise will be bad and so on. So what I want you to calculate is what will be this value of this resistor such that the V in to V mic is, is 0.5, okay? Um, and you'll see, why I have given that problem. And you can ask the faculty members, you know, I think most of them have seen this problem, so they'll be able to help you out if you get stuck too. Um, and I, you know, we can discuss next week as well. So that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is, uh, once you choose that RB, once you find out that bias resistor, uh, find the gain of the amplifier such that V out is minus 38 dBb RMS, uh, for, I didn't write it here, but for your uh, 10 millivolt RMS, like this, this, this input. So basically for your typical input of 94 dB SPL. So once you find this RB value, find out what this gain of this amplifier needs to be such that the V out is minus 38 dB RMS. Now I have no knowingly given you in dB V RMS because I want you to get used to calculating in dBb RMS. So your input is 10 millivolt RMS um, and your output is minus 10 dB RMS. So you first calculate what it is, it is what it is in volt RMS, okay? So, and I've given you here zero dB V RMS is equal to one volt RMS. So from that you can calculate, you know, what is minus 38 dB V RMS. So this is the easier part of the problem. It's a pretty, I mean, both of them are easy, just a straightforward. Um, and once you find the solution for these two part of the problems, uh, you know, we'll slowly develop the, and I'll show you why uh, this architecture, which is typically the architecture chosen for most microphone amplifiers is problematic. And, um, and so that's why we'll, we'll, we're gonna use a new architecture. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll not cover that in this lecture. I'll probably cover that in the next or, you know, maybe in a later lecture, okay? So I just want to quickly show you a typical uh, block diagram of uh, MEMS uh, microphone preamplifier. Um, like I just showed you, this is how the MEMS microphone uh, model looks like, voltage with a capacitive divider. And like as I said, you need to bias this node. So typically what people use is a reverse bias diode. Uh, and you'll understand why they use this once you solve that first part of the problem. So I'll not uh, explain more right now, I'll explain before, after that. And then usually it's followed by a buffer because you don't want to load this um, part of the amplifier and then followed by certain gain. And that's the gain you're going to calculate. Whatever gain you need, you'll, you, you'll put that gain over here. Then usually you have a voltage regulator because your external supply can vary a lot. So it can go, you know, sometimes from 2.5 to 5 volts. Your chip may be only tolerating inside only 1.8 volts, so you have to regulate that voltage to that. And there'll be also some bias circuitry to create your current mirrors, current uh, biases and so on. So this is how typically it'll look like. But again, um, we'll follow a different um, architecture, both for the low power as well as the high performance one. And this is just a typically, um, this is a typical um, 
a specification for a mobile microphone amplifier. Um, I'll not go into the detail because some of them uh, you probably um, may not understand right now. For example, the THD, uh, the SNR, and I might cover one lecture on noise and after that we'll come back to it. Um, I think that's all I wanted to cover. Um, so just wanted to give you a quick introduction on it. So today is going to be a short um, presentation.